Hey, well, good afternoon. Yeah. I want to welcome everybody to a monthly town hall with the mayor and the chiefs and Sergeant Steele. The chief. So, um, Sergeant, yeah. the acting chief <laughs> today. So um, we're grateful. We a little small audience, but I think that makes for an even more intimate discussion. So we're excited to hear what we talk about today. Um, we are broadcasting this, and so uh, when you do have questions, just raise your hand. I'll come bring you a microphone so that we can make sure that those who are remote have the chance to, to listen as well. Um, I'm Ryan Field. I work uh, in the, at the city here. I'll be your MC tonight. Um, we have Chief Greg Tominski from our fire department. We're grateful that Chief's here. And sitting in for Chief Hessing is... Uh, Sergeant Steele. So we're excited to have him today. We're uh, anxious. Last time we had one of these, we also had a member of our police department from our POP team here. So we're excited to see the, uh, what Sergeant Steele has to say to us tonight. And then, of course, we know um, the Honorable Mayor Trevor Chadwick, um, but Honorable. we're grateful to, to have him here tonight as well. This is really an open forum. So the, um, I'm going to ask each of the gentlemen to introduce themselves a little bit, talk a little bit about their department and their program. But please, at any time, ask questions. That's really what keeps these things going is your questions and your input. That's really what makes us. I've heard their spiel enough. I really like to hear your questions and, and uh, what you, you can bring to it. So um, I guess without further ado, Chief Tominski, kick us off, please. All right, well, thanks for coming. I'm Greg Tominski. I'm the fire chief of Star Fire Protection District and Middleton Rural Fire District. Um, if you haven't heard it before, and if you have, I'm sorry. The, uh, we, are, uh, one, we are two separate fire districts with two separate boards and two separate budgets, but we have a joint powers agreement to operate together. So we operate as one fire department. And by doing that, we save each district about $430,000 a year. And with that money that we save, we just put boots on the ground. So we are able to add another position at the station. So we have four people on duty in Middleton. And then with what we saved with Star, we're finally able to open the Kingsbury station after it sat empty for 10 years. So that's exciting. It's been open for a couple of years now. So uh, we have... Uh, two engines and a truck and a battalion chief that respond from all three of the stations, 24 seven, 365. As you guys probably have heard, we are proposing a permanent levy increase. And I will talk a little bit about that today. Um, I can tell you, can we just go into it now? Sure. Or you just want to introduce first? No, you can. You can okay. You might as well do your spot and then okay. Steele can do his I didn't thing. mean to take everybody's thunder. <laughs> Um, so the reason that we're asking for down. the permanent... I'm going to sit down. I'm going to listen. All right. Good idea. That's right. We're asking for the permanent levy increases. As you may have noticed on uh, Floating Feather Road, we are getting ready to start a fire station. Uh, that fire station will be fire station number 55. Um, that has been paid for 100% by impact fees. So the growth on in that portion has been paying for itself. Um we could buy apparatus and we can buy buildings with impact fees. What we can't do is buy people and we can't uh, buy equipment that has a life expectancy of 10 years or less. All of the equipment that our firefighters wear um, has a life expectancy of less than 10 years. So that is all on the district to repurchase. The other thing that impact fees can't be used for is replacement. So we can only build and buy things that growth caused, not uh, replacement. So that is also on the tax dollars that you already pay. So to staff that station 55, we uh, can't just hire one person. Like the police officers, hiring a police officer, like for a pop team or one or two is, is fantastic. They can do amazing things and they have done amazing things with it. But for us, we have to hire a minimum of nine people. That's what it takes to staff an engine 365 every day. So back in 2020, our legislature passed a bill back then. It was called House Bill 389 that limited the amount of what we can grow our budget. We used to be able to grow our budget by the 3% statutorily. 
and then we would get 100% of new construction and annexation, which in my opinion, that is growth paying for itself. Uh, when that house bill passed, they capped us at 8%. And our districts, both of them, Middleton and Star, have been growing at a higher rate than 8%. So we've been going backwards. We still increase our budget every year. It's not that we're, we're losing um, the budget that we had. We just can't grow it fast enough to hire the people. We have to build the budget authority to be able to staff those fire stations. So it put us in the position that we had to come to our taxpayers and ask for a levy increase to make up that difference. So that's the reason that we're asking for it. Um, we wanna be able to maintain the response time. We have a goal of five minutes or less in, within the city. And then the farther you get out, the longer that time is. But with the 18, 20,000 vehicles that come through our um, town every day. I mean, they, they, most of them aren't generated here. They're generated outside of here, all the way Ontario, Caldwell, Notus, Parma, wherever, travel through to do their, go to their jobs. It's a major highway, everybody's allowed to use it. And our response times suffer. So by putting that station over on Loading Feather Road, we'll be able to respond to those areas of our district better plus up Highway 16, we go all the way to the Gem County line. We actually go across Highway 16 into Eagle City Limits. Star Fire District is inside the portions of the city limits of, of Eagle. Uh, if you're familiar with the, used to be called Spring Valley, now it's called Valnova Development. That has a future, we'll have 6,000 houses in it someday. 2,200 of those are in the Star Fire District. So, need the microphone, sorry. <laughs> so the ones that are in Eagle will, will get levered, leverage also? Yes, Every, everybody within the boundaries of the fire district. It's not just the citizens of Star or the citizens of Middleton. So it, it is the entire district. Uh, Star Fire District is 55 square miles. I wish I can tell you a road that it was split on, but it is so jagged all over the place that I can't even remotely tell you exactly where it is. And um, the Gem County line is to the north to Canada, and then it comes down Canada Road to, if there was a Willis Road that connected to it, it goes across there, but there isn't one there. It goes all the way to Lansing. It's actually about 200 yards past Lansing to the middle of a field and then goes across the river um, and some portions of it go to 2026 and some, and then Canada, it'll go all the way to Eustick, come across where the new high school is right around there, it comes back down and it's very jagged on the, on the east side. So the Star Fire Protection District actually has um, the city of Star, unincorporated Ada County, unincorporated Canyon County, the city of Middleton, and the city of Eagle, portions of those within it. So that's the story of the, of the Star side. Middleton has 110 square miles. Um, they currently have the one fire station. We're asking for a levy increase there as well for a building that we had out on Harvey road between uh, Goodson and Galloway that we're going to remodel, turn it into a staffed fire station so we can have better response times there. Uh, we currently um, have AVL, which is a, a system that ca calls the closest unit. So at times, like a good example was uh, last Saturday when we had a couple of folks decided they needed to jump in the river and take a swim and get stuck in the middle of the river. It takes all of our people, which we had 12 on duty, it takes all of our people to deploy the boat and get everybody in safety positions and so on and so forth to get the boat in the water, get the folks out of the water safely. And then we have other calls happening at the same time. So we actually had, had all of our units tied up on call. We had another unit uh, from Eagle another unit from Caldwell on calls um, in the Star Fire District at that same time. So we're able to handle it. We just want to be able to handle it in a timely manner. 
seconds count for us on some of the calls. I mean, change in smoke detector batteries. We don't have to run code to that. We don't have to run code to uh, certain things, but the things that we do have to run code to, heart attacks, strokes, car accidents, fires, we need to get there because seconds count. So, so real quick, did, how many of you knew that Star Fire will help you change your batteries and your smoke detectors if you have high ceilings? So, and that's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the biggest reason is, 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 you know, we got folks that don't feel comfortable on ladders anymore. And so we would rather have our young guys go out and climb a ladder, change your batteries or whatever, than having to go out there in an emergency situation and pick you up off the ground. Me, me too, because my fat wobbles when I get on the ladder. You got a lot less than you used to. I, I have less, but yes. <laughs> cool. Do you have any questions? Any questions? What she asked, what else did the fire department do? Uh, well, <laughs> we seem to get the phone calls for just about anything. Um, this time of year, I've seen some baby ducks. So we uh, spend a lot of time this time of year. Of course, if there's an emergency, we will leave the ducks and come back. But uh, we do save a lot of ducks. I want to say that last year, they kept a tally in star on the board in the fire station, and they were up in the 30 or 40 ducklings that they had saved. They apparently walked down the street with their mom and fallen storm drains. So, right, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the challenge, right? With the uh, not just that. I mean, we get called for um, hazardous material calls. We get called well, the, when the gas line explosion. All of our all of our uh, units were busy on that for quite a while. Um, obviously, fires, car accidents, um, any medical calls, uh, lift assists, uh, smoke detector batteries, uh, trench rescues, water rescues, uh, uh, people that have uh, motorcycle accidents in the BLM ground or um, hurt themselves on a trail as they're walking through the BLM ground, grass fires in the BLM. Uh, just because it's BLM ground, we are still the first response to that. Uh, those units, um, the closest BLM unit we have to us is at uh, Highway 55 and Beacon Light. And so those units will come, but we'll, we'll get called first because it's within our district. A lot of times they'll take it over. Uh, after we all get it under control, they'll, they're the ones that are going to spend the night there, but it still takes all of our resources to do that and numerous other calls that we get. That's pretty, pretty elaborate thing that they have going on with the fire department and stuff. And a lot of cool firefighters over there and, you know, both men and women on the department, which is awesome. Yep. So. Yeah, I'll just add to that a little bit, chief, if I may. Um, uh, we as a city just, uh, opened up a, a new center that we are calling our rec center. Then a lot of our youth are in there and we're doing activities and classes and things with them. It's right between the police station and the fire station. And so when they're not out on calls, a lot of times they're able to come over and interact with the kids that are in the facility, both on the fire department and the police department. And so it's, it's been a huge um, advantage for us to have our youth there because now they're getting to experience the interaction there um, hopefully, maybe there's some future firefighters there and some future law enforcement officers there, but they're learning that these are people that are there to help them. They're not there to, um, they're not the bad guy. And I think that's a huge advantage to our community as well. And, and one of the other things that he didn't mention that they do is they have a junior cadet program, right? Yeah, we do. We just started it. Uh, one of our battalion chiefs was very familiar for, with the program where he came from and uh, San Bernardino, where we have uh, 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old um, high school kids that are thinking they might be interested in the fire service. So they come, and they come on Sundays, and then they're getting the basic training. We can't put them in live fire. There's a lot of things that we can't do with them, but teach them the, how to act in a fire department, how, in this fire station, how to interact with the on-duty crew, how the gear to wear, we have gear for them that they they get to try on and use, um, ladders. I mean, all the things that up until the point where they would go into a fire. And our goal, like back up a little bit, 
So the reason that we started the program is we used to be able to hire firefighters, like just like everybody wanted to do it. I can tell you that Boise used to, when they uh, put out an application process for firefighters, they would get close to 3,000 applicants. Today, they get about 300. So you go down to a smaller scale like, like we are, they are big enough that they will take somebody with a high school uh, diploma, and then they will give them their EMT class and their firefighter one class and teach them all the way up. But we don't have enough staff to put on an EMT class in a 14 week academy. So we ask for the EMT to have that ahead of time and firefighter one. So our goal is to take these young folks and if they decide to stay in the program, great. And if they decide that this isn't for me, they go on try something else, that's great as well. But our goal will be to have them already uh, knowing how to interview, knowing how to take tests, knowing how to get into the CWI program. When they graduate high school, they get into the CWI fire science program. They get their firefighter one, their EMT, and then they come to work for us at the second level that we have, which is an internship. So they, call, they pay their college tuition, they come to us, and they have 480 hours that they have to do. So that we ask them to work. 24-hour uh, shifts until their 480 hours is done. They get their task book signed off. And if they're still interested in staying with us, then they get one of our task books, and then they can move up to a part-time position. So we're trying to groom those younger folks from a young age that want to be in the fire service, or they think that they do. And if they do, they, they stay there. And hopefully we, our goal someday is to be able to hire all of our folks from that program, starting from the young going through uh, the CWI program and the internship into the part-time position and then eventually getting hired full-time. That is the goal with it. Yeah, pretty cool. Well, hey, Ryan, just leave the microphone. <laughs> How do you recruit these young people? Um, so far, it's been word of mouth. So we had two of our firefighters that uh, have uh, young kids that wanted to be in it or wanted to were asking about it. So they started it and then just word of mouth with their friends. And then on Facebook, they have uh, uh, Midstar Cadets is on Facebook and they advertised. And so they have 10 now, 10 cadets. Have you considered going to the Boy Scout troops? Because once the Boy Scout hits 16 and gets their eagle or 18, they may be, that might be an option. If you're going to, you got to talk into the microphone. That might be an option too. <laughs> so far, um, well, first they wanted to start the program with six. And so they just raised it to 10. They have had to turn away about 20 because we don't have enough staff to uh, accommodate that many people. And they're just, our folks are just donating their time right now. Um, to the program to see how it works. This, we're in a pilot right now, and the, and obviously the pilot is going to take off and become permanent because there is so much interest. And we're thrilled that, to get it. Yeah, that's really Creativity. Hey, do you want to go? Sure. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Sergeant Jonathan Seal. I'm a sergeant here in STAR. I've uh, been in here for, what, five years now? I think five years in STAR now. Um, I started here as a deputy, worked my way up to a property crimes detective, and then into the now sergeant role. So I've been a sergeant for a little over a year now. Right? I think that's how long we've had the position. So it's been going really well. Um, so STAR Police is comprised of 18 commissioned deputies um, in total. We're a contract city with Ada County Sheriff's Office. Is everybody kind of aware of what that is here for the most part? Okay, so I'll, I'll do a quick brief overview, but there's uh, the contract cities uh, like Star, Eagle, and CUNA can all go to the sheriff's office and ask for police services. Um, and it turns out to be a great deal, especially financially for the cities, because I believe it's about half the cost of what it would actually run um, if we were to have our own here. Plus we get a lot more resources with it than yes. we would have had before. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so it's... Uh, and there's a lot more connectivity between us all, us and the Eagle people. We go to trainings all the time. We know each other. 
um, and just Ada County as a whole, all of the North County unincorporated areas, the deputies that are up there are generally down here at our substation, writing reports and doing stuff like that. So um, being able to figure out, you know, crime patterns and trends and all of that, it makes it a lot easier for us to just stay connected. So it's, it's a great, great opportunity and it's a really good program that we have running on that end. Uh, as of right now, we have, uh, I believe it's five on each side of the week. We have two sides of the week. So we have a silver side and a blue side. So we have five deputies throughout the day. Um, then we have a pop team that is two dedicated uh, members of the team. And they're mainly focusing on traffic and then um, problem oriented policing. So anything that's warrants, drugs, anything along those lines, that's why it's called the pop team or the pop stars, you know, either one. Pop stars. <laughs> So all right, now we need to we we have to do something with that now. Put their faces on. Yeah, we're we're trying. I think they should you know join a dance competition or something. Okay. <laughs> so um, so we have them. We have three detectives. We have one property crimes detective and then uh, two persons crimes detectives. So then obviously Chief Hessing, and then we have a, an administrative assistant, which is Jada at the front desk. So yeah. Uh, department is going extremely well. Um, uh, I, I mean, I believe at least, and I think if you, uh, you know, Chief Hessing will go over the March, uh, March police report. If you have any questions about it, I have it in front of me. But um, our proactive policing, especially since adding the POP team, has gone through the roof. And uh, I know that term may be misconstrued at times. What is proactive policing? Well, the biggest factor to that is having a cop being out there and being seen. And it could be a multitude of things. It could be a traffic stop. It could be hanging out with kids at the park. It could be being in the schools. It could be going to a business and contacting a business owner and talking to them about new trends. Um, it, it could be a lot of different things of what proactive policing actually is, uh, being in construction site zones, you know, because especially at night, that is a huge problem. Uh, you know, free OSB, you know, who wouldn't want it? So the proactive policing has really gone through the roof um, here in star and you've seen how the more cops that are out there being seen our crime rates are going down and on top of that our calls for service are actually going down pretty drastically especially for how much growth that we have coming into star funny how that works right yeah. what a novel concept i know it's crazy <laughs> any questions on us or what we're doing and I, will, I will tell you though that they have had when they get people with drugs that tra transporting drugs have said to our officers, I was told not to come through here. That is good. When people think that, oh my goodness, they'll go somewhere else. I'll let the, somebody else have to deal with that. Right? I was literally just on a stop a, a couple of weeks ago and we stopped the guy and he uh, had just come from Ontario getting his marijuana. And he's like, my buddies told me not to drive through here, but the traffic was so bad. I thought I would just try and go to the star. And what do you know? Uh, it was just, it was a perfect, yeah. Yep, so, ha so having that reputation is a good reputation to have to help keep that stuff out of our neighborhoods and stuff here. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Any questions of Sergeant Steele? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So currently we don't have any canines. In uh, star. In star. So it, uh, we have a canine program with Ada County Sheriff's. Um, now, I believe currently, I, I would have to look back, so don't quote me on this. I believe there's roughly nine canines. We have apprehension. Uh, we're, we're transitioning because we, you have an apprehension dog, uh, which is more for, you know, uh, bites on, you know, felony criminals and all that. And then you have drug canines, and I believe we have one bomb canine. So um, if you look at the canine program, we don't have any designated just for STAR, but I do know that the mayor and the city council are currently looking at that um, for out here. So the city of Boise has a set of canines also, and so does the city of Meridian. And Boise, they have some out on patrol, but they have a lot at, this, at, the, at the airport up there. Yeah. yeah, I was pretty, I saw them when I flew out here a few weeks ago. They were all there training. I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize they had that many dogs out there, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. So the canine thing we are looking at here in the city of Star um, to see if that's something we want, because... The use of a canine is very specific on on what the laws say on 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 stopping somebody and having a canine there, right? And so, you, if you want to talk about that, you can. If you don't, you're all right with that too. Yeah. So, the, uh, a canine is a great resource and a great tool. Um, now, depending on 
do you want uh, pointed ears or fluffy ears, right? Pointed ears are your apprehension, fluffy ears are your, uh, you know, generally your dog, uh, your drug or narcotic dog. So um, they also, you fluffy can also, ears. fluffy or floppy ears, floppy ears or pointed <laughs> ears. Um, so it's just something that the cops say, do you want a pointed ear or do you want a floppy ear dog? Uh, so it, they're a great tool and a great resource. Um, obviously out here, we generally don't, have a bunch of felony crime happening. So um, an apprehension canine may or may not fit, um, but the narcotic portion of it is something that we definitely want to hit on. Now you can have a mixture of both. You can have a narcotic dog and an apprehension dog in the same. Um, so it's a great tool and a great resource. However, with that, there comes certain challenges. Um, they, they are an awesome tool and an awesome resource that we would love to use as much as possible. But um, the Supreme Court, well, Idaho Supreme Court and other courts have established that we cannot, uh, there has to be a very clear process on how we do things, especially with canines. So we cannot deviate from our stops at all to try and see if there's any narcotics or any, anything along those lines. So it's a tool that is great and, and will do a bunch of wonders here uh, in STAR, especially for the majority of all of our, our narcotic violations are passed through. Um, there are obviously are some here in star, but the mass majority are just passed through. Well, some people may say, well, is that a huge deal? Eh, yes and no, right? Yes. It's passing through. So it's not staying here in star, but where's it going to, and who are they talking to as they come through, you know, are they talking to stopping by the high school or they're stopping by somebody else's house who knows kids in high school? Um, you know, even if they're coming through, can it still, does it affect your neighborhood or the outlying communities that is then going to seep into your town? So um, a, a canine officer, a canine is a great tool and a great asset, um, but there are some hard stipulations and, and things that we have to do when, we're, when using them. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Is the interested in increasing revenue? What's that? If you're interested in increasing revenue, Oh, tickets. So that, that's a little different. That's not necessarily true for the cities on increasing revenue. Tickets don't really give us revenue. <laughs> There's very little money that we ever get back from the, from the system. About $7,000 a year is about it on all the tickets that are written. Yeah. So that's not, a, that's not really a tool for us here. So you always hear, well, they must be, it must be the end of the month or pulling a lot of people over. Right, kind of a thing. And that's, well, yeah. the end of the month, beginning of the month, it don't matter because it doesn't really change anything. Yes, yeah, so we do not have quotas. That, that, that's, right. a, that's an old myth. You know, we don't have quotas that we have to meet. We don't have anything along those lines. Uh, actually, it looks like in March of 24, we made 445 traffic stops, which is a, a huge increase from March of 2023. We did 242. So that just goes to show what the POP team has really done. Um, out of the 445 traffic stops we did in March, we wrote 81 tickets. So you say that's it, but our purpose of the traffic stop and especially a ticket isn't just, uh, we, we don't want to financially hit you right now every single time. And that's not what we want to be known for is every single time you get stopped, you're going to get a ticket. We want to educate the public. And if it's something that is so uh, obscene, then yes, uh, a little, a little money, tag with that violation is going to make you really remember it next time. So our biggest, our biggest thing is, I mean, I will tell you right now, when everybody drives through, you see a cop car sitting in front of the water station, or, you know, sewer and water. That is me. That's my spot. I keep all the other guys out. of. <laughs> That's me every time. I would, yeah. Say hi. Well, and you can't miss him. He's in a truck. I'm in the truck. Yes. Um, and I will tell you, almost every single person. And I, you know, we follow social media as well. So we always see it on there, you know, and it's just like, he's in front of the water station again. And uh, so, but it's, it's a thing that everybody knows uh, slow down. That's where we have kids going back and forth to the Merck and the cafe and going down to the river on main street. Um, you know, that, that's one of the biggest things is, you know, how can we make sure that everybody's continuously being safe and always knowing, you know, where our speed limits and what our laws are and what our codes and statutes are. And, and that's where it comes into play. We don't want to have to give a, a, a ticket every single time. We just want to educate the public. And like I said, a lot of people are passed through. 
Um, and we want to educate them like, hey, if you now work in, you know, Eagle and you live in Middleton and you're taking this route, it goes from 55 to 35 to 25 to 25 to 35 to 55. Uh, it is, but it's also the heart of our town. And I know it's, I know it can be annoying uh, when driving through, but that, like I said, is where our main pedestrians are walking through. And that's where a lot of the congestion is. So the slower, the better um, when we have all of that congestion. Yeah. From Middleton, nobody's going 35 when it's posted. No, they they come through quick, you know, but we don't have enough officers to sit there all the time either to bus people. Right, right. So, Floating Feather will be busy, especially now that we're connected to Highway 16, and it's intended to be busy. It's considered an arterial road, and so it's supposed to collect traffic. Same thing with Beacon Light and New Hope, an arterial road. Canada. Star Road and Plummer Roads are considered arterial roads. So every one of those roads are intended to collect whatever traffic's there. The only thing that we've had for a long time is not having that straight on connection for Floating Feather. Eventually, Canada, I'm sorry, Floating Feather is going to connect to Canada over here by Munger. It's going to go straight through to uh, Canada and continue west into towards Middleton, all the way to Kingsbury. Um, so you'll have another east west route. If something were to happen on, high, on Highway 44, and you can bypass that a little bit and get around if you needed to. Yeah, so Ryan, you wanna, you might have to stand up here with the microphone. Are there any plans to expand Floating Feather? Yeah, so Floating Feather, every one of those roads we talk about, there are plans to expand them. It's just gonna take some time. And it's, this is stuff that we've been working with ACHD on. So Floating Feather initially is gonna get expanded probably to three lanes first, right? So you have a center turn lane all the way through. Um, there is, so I don't know if you've seen the sidewalk, sidewalk work that's been going on by the church up there, the plumber. That's something that we did are doing as a city uh, to put that sidewalk back to the school. Uh, we got a grant this last year. We've been planning this for years and happened the grant. We applied for the grant several years ago and all of a sudden it showed up that they had extra money and they gave it to us last year. We're like, oh, well, because we were planning on spending city money to get it done and the grant showed yeah. up. So that was awesome. And so all those little projects like that are being built um, according to what ACHT's master width is gonna be so they don't have to tear that stuff up in the future, right? And they can just do that widening. You do see some development where they just put a gravel shoulder in, then that, that frustrates me to no end, yeah. right? This is something that we're trying to get ACHT to change the way that they do business because we don't control the roads at all as a city. ACHT controls them and we try to get them to change policy a little bit, I think, to benefit us now instead of 10 years down the road, right? We, I want them to widen it. I don't care if it's just a quarter mile or an eighth mile section that gets widened. I'll make the developer widen it at that time instead of collecting the impact fees that I may or may not ever see because they use it somewhere else in the county, right? So that, that's some of the challenges that we're facing with some of that. Um, Pollard Road is also another one, that one that goes by the school that's going to be um, an arterial. And that one's a challenge because it has the big drain. Um, so it, that water that comes through that drain actually starts an eagle up there. Uh, is that Dry Creek up there? What is that? What is that? Uh, up there past the golf course going up where the sports park is. Yeah, well, it's up towards Spring Valley. It's kind of the water flows out of there when we have massive rains comes down through the golf course and down that drain, right? Uh, and so that's a hard one to figure out how to tile or, or whatever to make that road a little wider. It's gonna probably impact some of those houses over there at some point on the uh, on Pollard, so. So with the progression on 40, I'll just, I'll just repeat the question. So the progression on 44 uh, from Star Road here, this direction, so the, that we're hoping in a, this is a move, this keeps moving, this target's frustrating to me. I'm hoping best case scenario next year, worst case scenario 2026 for that, to get, for this section to get done, uh, the Highway 16. Um, with that, you're gonna see uh, some reconfiguration of uh, Plummer uh, Road there, um, which would be good. The, um, Star Road originally was gonna have this quarter CFI on it, which is, which is a weird crossover maneuver. You know, it's like Ricky Bobby trying to go through a race course, you know, uh, on there. But they got, they scrapped that plan 
uh, thank goodness, because we don't want to see that. I don't think these guys want to see that plan out there uh, for a more standardized intersection. Over there. Um, but that's going to be a five lane segment when they get that done. If you notice when we did, we did as a city that project on the other side through proportionate share, um, we did the restriping up here to in front of city hall to kind of spread out that traffic and it's held out quite a bit by just doing that little segment there. So, yep. so that's the plan for that. Yeah. Oh, the mic's good. I don't have to repeat it then. So at Cosmo and 44. When you're coming oh, right, right here. I know. Yeah. I think I talked to you about this before that when you're yep. coming out to make a left, people pulling into McDonald's the way that that was situated there just doesn't work for you trying to get out of your neighborhood. The lot, the, um, well, is there anything that you guys can do to make that area better right now? Like, as it sits, like as far as trying to get out of Cosmo, turning left, right? Mm -hmm. And people are backed up in the turn lane to go into McDonald's. So what you're probably, this is my guess is it's going to happen. It's the same thing that's probably going to happen at Taurus. Because Taurus is going to have the same issue coming off of that and going eastbound when it comes five lanes. Same, same concept on both sides. I almost see them forcing those to be a right in and right out only uh, intersections. Okay. Makes and then sense. I would force you to go to Seneca Springs or to Plummer. And we have a, we got approval through ITD when we did our own traffic study to put a light at Seneca Springs in the future. Okay. So that way you could go left. That's where I see that going in the future. Oh, and that would help traffic. Yeah, it'll help traffic flow and stuff like that there. So a lot next next to uh, that area that's empty? Mm -hmm. Is there anybody that has plans to build there? Originally, right now, uh, First Interstate Bank came through the city and got a CUP a CUP done to build a bank there. I don't know what their plans are because it has a sign up there for sale. They may not be doing it, um, but that was over a year ago, I think, that we had Is there anything hearing. about a Taco Bell? Uh, Taco Bell came and spoke to us right next door to, to that, but they haven't, they, haven't, they haven't submitted an application or anything, and that was quite some time ago. Okay, yeah. makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Well, it's, it's not necessarily a rumor. They truly did come and speak to us as a city, they had their neighborhood meeting. They got some feedback, which I don't think they probably want to build there in that location <laughs> at, at that point, right? So they have not, and that was a couple months ago, I think they did the neighborhood meeting and they haven't submitted anything. Typically those folks don't wait that long to submit. So I'm thinking either they're going through a complete redesign or they're going to be looking for a different location is my guess. Not in and out, I'm going to tell you, after seeing the debacle up there in the village, I want nothing to do with in and out being in star. However, with that said, I did reach out to him before they even started thinking about it, about that because that was the most common theme. But we don't fit their profile out here in star. They're supposed to put one up on, uh, by Costco at 10 miles, supposedly. And I'm like, how in the world is that going to happen? Based on what I saw, this could be a disaster up there. So, yeah. Yeah. And then so, huh? go ahead. Go, go. I was just going to say on, on the on the roadside, on some of the stuff that we're working on the roadside, we did get um, ACHD to, originally it was 2035, I think it was, when they were going to do Star Road, uh, start the design and stuff on Star Road. We did get them to push this up till next year where they're going to start their study and design. Uh, so 10 years earlier, because we got to get that. That's our only north-south route, truly, for our city right there. It's going to be painful when they do the construction. Everybody just needs to be fully aware. It's going to suck. Some fears, right? Because they're going to have to rebuild that bridge. They have like five total bridges out there. Well, the one development up top is working on the widening, if you haven't seen that um, up there. But uh, they got five total bridges that have to be widened, but the big one's over the river, right? Um, so that'll be a good thing for us. Now, we are also... Um, I'm, I'm the chairman of Compass, which is our regional planning organization for our valley. Uh, it's an MPO that's required by the feds to get federal money for state high, for highway improvements and stuff. So I did a presentation to him this week about we want a, uh, another river crossing at Kingsbury uh, to two miles down from here. Right now, it's, as there's only one crossing here, six miles as a crow flies, is the Middleton crossing. If we can get a crossing at Kingsbury, that'll alleviate all this traffic that we were, who was talking about it? You, I think, 
I was talking about the 20,000 vehicle trips per day that come here. They can hit that. This Highway 2026 will be widened uh, soon all the way down, and people are going to use that to flow into town and be a lot less restrictive. Um, we are looking at a new highway in North Star and North Middleton. Uh, we propose to put one basically from Galloway off Interstate 84 and connect all the way up here to RE Way. If we can get that segment, that'd be great too, because that'll, that'll pull people from coming down this way, go that direction, hit Highway 16, and it could be planned right. It could be planned so much different than what Highway 44 is with all these different access points, right? We can do what we are looking at is, do we want to make this a one mile segment for access or two mile segments on that, that thing and then have all the planning funnel all the traffic to that so that can be a true highway like what they're doing with Highway 16 to really get traffic to move, right? Um, and then, of course, we're looking at the floating feather intersection we were just talking about. Uh, we're having some little conflict right now with ITD on trying to get a full access intersection there. We gave them some designs of some alternate ways of getting that done, and they just keep pushing back, but they need our sign-off in order to move their thing forward. So we got a little bit of leverage, the leverage that we're working on, right, with that. Yes. means you could go on and off, left and right, all directions, just like a normal intersection. Because what they want to do right now, they just, originally they wanted just a cul-de-sac, those, not give any access. Then they came back and said that we'll do an overpass. And I'm like, well, that doesn't do us any good on getting on Highway 16. We only got five access points to the highway system, really, in the city of Star right now. And if you take that away. So then we were talking and said, well, can you at least give me my emergency services a lane that goes north and a lane that goes south with a gate and an opticon. So if they get a call, they don't have to go all the way around to get on the highway 16. They go straight down the road, go, because every second matters. So they keep running these things through their models, right? And I think models are flawed. It's not showing reality. And I think we can make it work. Um, you just have to make some adjustments. Highway 44 and highway 16 overpass, that's gonna go right there. Where 16 is gonna go over 44, is actually going out to bid in August and the plans to have that completed in two years. And that's some of the challenge with, high, with floating feather is that distance and people coming off of a freeway basically and coming down towards floating feather. And that's what we're trying to work through that challenge on how we can make that work without the weaving and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then what else we got? I'm trying to, it's been a lot, a lot of moving parts um, on the transportation side here in the city of Star. You know, we do have a proportionate share agreement still in place where every brand new house that's built, no one else is doing this in the state of Idaho, but every house that's built, um, $1,000 from every house goes into uh, this proportionate share to help fund unfunded sections of our state highways because we have three of them in the city of Star. And that's what funded this project that we did in front of Albertsons over there. We were able to use that for that. And that people were looking at that like, how did you do that? Well, and if we don't have a highway department, well, I don't have we were able to get this design built uh, in, 18, in 18 months and open. The highway, the highway departments and ITT take five or six years to get anything done, right? And we have a staff of 23 people here in the city of, or 24 people here in the city of Star, and we got it taken care of that way because we understand that process, right? And we think outside the box with that. You don't want to know. So... <laughs> So for every new house that's built in STAR, you can almost figure 2.94 is what Compass uses as a number for the number of residents per, per house. Right now in, the, in the, all the city of STAR, we are at, the numbers just came out Monday that were just approved from Compass, is 20,340 people in the city of STAR. 9,000 of those since 2020, since COVID. 9,000. We've increased by 9,000. Is people want to move here. They're getting out of, obviously, I don't know where you guys all came from, where you're from here or not. I'm from here. He's from here. You know, Greg's basically from here. You know, Dana, Dana came here a long time ago, right? 11,127 people. 20,340. So here's the funny, I can't even update those. That's a, so even when they put the signs out, ITD, put, they, they put them on the 10-year census. Yeah, that's the only number they use. But when they put them out, it was like two years later. I'm like, you need to put the actual number from this year instead of two years ago. So, so, so it's not a surprise, right? 
So one of these nights you might see, well, here, play yours. I might go out there and just handwrite it on there or something. I want to know who it is. Put some stickers. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Doing a, doing a study as far as speed, making it. Oh, so IT, so it's an ITD. Uh, so she was asking a question about the speed on 44, right? So ITD is still doing that study where we're going to, where they're going to probably, it's probably going to be 30 miles an hour, in my guess, from Highway 16 all the way to Canada Road, a, a singular uh, speed at that direction, right? It hasn't, they're not done with that whole thing yet. I don't. I don't think it's going to be in conjunction with that. I think it'll happen before that. Uh, on there is my guess. So yeah. Okay. Yep. So that's that's the uh, the uh, population. It's growing. The entire valley is growing. The entire valley has grown uh, by 140,000 people in the last four years. That's a ton. That's a city of Meridian. The entire city of Meridian growth in four years, and between Ada and Canyon County. That doesn't include Jim County. Payette County, Washington County, or Waihee County that all impact everything in here, or Elmore County, right, on the east side. That's just Ada and Canyon County right there. Um, we do have, I mean, right now, uh, this year, we do have a lot of housing permits. Uh, still, I, it blows me away in this environment that we're in that there's, well, the higher interest rates and the higher material costs that they're able to, that they're selling these houses and we're probably going to have more houses uh permits this year than any other year about how many about a thousand take that times 2.94 right 2,944 people well it helps so this is the so this is where this is the challenge it does not because of that eight percent cap that the state has put on everybody you cannot now use new construction to help fund growth. They've killed that ability. Because isn't Mike gonna fix it? No, Mike is the one that put it into place. I know. Yes. But so because they hate I'm gonna just they go after a couple cities that they don't like and they impact everybody else. There's 198 cities in the state of Idaho. They got to hang up with the city of Boise and the city of Meridian, the two largest cities in the state of Idaho, and they make legislation to, to try to combat them, and it impacts everybody else, and that's a problem, right? Because small cities like Star, so here, we only levy about $1.9 million in the city of Star. That's it. That's all the property tax levy for the city on a $3 billion value in the city of Star. Think about that. That's very little money that we levy. They levy 2.4, 3, 3.6, 3 3.6 million on over a $3 billion value because their district goes outside the city. District Very value. Very little money. 4.3 billion. 4.3 billion is what it is. So there's this 4.3 billion for the district wide. So the, it's changed. you got to get your legislature to change it. It takes people down here to say, listen, you have to, you, you, here, here's uh, the unfortunate thing is, they don't listen to the cities, right? We, we've been talking and talking and talking. They say, well, you just want to tax people, tax, tax people. To death. No, that's not the case. We want to provide police. We want to provide fire. We need to make sure our sewer and water district is in line for everybody. We need to make sure our roads are appropriate. But we can't do that. There is no fat in our stuff. But you have cities like Meridian that has $200 million in savings. They freak out about that. Well, when you freak out about that, you're impacting everybody else. The I worry more right now about the communities of Parma and Notice and Greenleaf, those areas over there that have a levy amount of about $900,000 or excuse me, $100,000 to about $190,000 because any subdivision that decides to come in there is going to sink them because they will not be able to pay for police. They will not be able to pay for the fire. They won't be able to pay for the critical infrastructure for that. And the state does not allow us to put building caps in place. We're not allowed to do it. It's illegal. We cannot go and say, okay, great. You're going to make it an 8% that I can grow my budget by? Then I'm going to do an 8% cap, right? I'm going to figure out what that number is. They don't allow that. It's illegal. That's the challenge that we're facing. So that's why people, you need to stop growth. You need to, I, I can't. Entitlements are there. Private property rights are huge in Idaho. A lot of people moved here because they want less government. And when we started doing that, that's more government, right? 
So that's, we can't do that here in Idaho. That's our challenge that we're facing. So we're trying to figure out ways to make this work. We as a city also stood outside the box and I went to the BCA and the building or in the uh, Realtors Association and said, we're putting mitigation fees in place to help try to, to help try to pay for additional fire and additional police, right? Problem with mitigation fees is a one-time fee on every new house. It's not an ongoing thing. So unless you have growth to help pay for that, at some point that money is going to dry up and you're going to have to find an alternate source to, to cover that difference, right? And, and, you know, some people tell me that's extortion fees from other mayors. I'm saying, I, you could call it whatever you want, but it's not. It's trying to be responsible and trying to make certain my city is serviced and my citizens are protected uh, in this growth that we have, right? So did you want to say Yeah, something? I was going to add to that real quick. Uh, what I get that... passionate about this. If you, uh, so, so, some, sometimes I get very, we have some very interesting conversations sometimes because I get really vocal about it in here because it really frustrates me to no end that we have this mentality where these guys can't do their jobs to protect us that are out here in the community, right? Really yeah. So to answer your question about does it help, so it helps when you come to this permanent levy increase that we're, that we're asking for. The state statute says we have to base that number that we're asking for, the $53.83 per $100,000 of taxable value. It says we have to base that number off of 2023's property values. So if... Yeah. No, well, to, the, to the get it started, amount. to yeah. determine the amount, that's the $53.83. 53 so this community is growing. Everybody knows that. The whole district is growing. So when this levy, if it passes, this levy, because of the value increase, will not be $53.83. It's going to be less. So the 1,000 houses, if there is a 1,000 houses built in 20 commercial buildings or whatever it is, that's going to add to the fire district's $4.3 billion of value which will bring the number per $100,000 down. But I can't tell you what that number is until those numbers come out in 2020. This summer. They come out this summer. Yeah, in June. So you had meetings. Hundreds. Oh. You guys too, everybody together. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've spent it's, time it's, in his office at the Capitol. I've, he's been in my office. I We've. I mean, we constantly meet. He, so uh, I'm going to be honest, guys. Mike is the guy that controls that that switch, that tag. He's the one, because no one in the legislature is going to go against Mike right now. They are not going to, um, whenever you try to talk to them, they say that, well, we got to talk to Mike about it. They won't introduce a bill to try to make the change unless Mike signs off on it. That's just the reality of the situation. Oh, I think you were. Oh, for a bill. Yeah, but that. So what? I think once once we get through this election cycle here, and we get into this next legislative session, because they he's been working on on language with the state legislative office to try to make some changes for the special districts. Here's my thing. I I would be like to be selfish and and have it for everybody, but understand that we need to have some wins in this and make some changes. So public safety aspect can survive, right? So if we can just get the special districts fixed this next year, that'd be fantastic. Then we won't have to, he won't have to go through this whole exercise of trying to get in a levy increase. We can try to correct that, but we, we can't correct what we've already lost. You have to, you have to fill in that gap. So you got to think about the uh, special district. So you got cities, you got counties, and you got everything else as a special district. So a city, I mean, Trevor can speak to this better than I can, but he collects $1.9 million of property tax. He's got a budget that is about $13 million total. About $13 million. The fire district collects about $3.6 million in property tax. And our budget is $3.6 million. We're 97% reliant on property tax. We have nothing to sell. There's nothing that that we can sell in, in sta state statute. It tells us how much we can charge for a daycare inspection In state statute. It says how much every development that comes in, we review the plans and give our comments to the city 
we can charge the hourly rate of the person doing it by a reasonable amount of hours. A reasonable amount of hours in their mind, just a couple hours. So you're talking $100 here, $50 there. So the fire marshal's office, Victor's office at, in, inside the fire department, fire district, it generates less than $100,000 a year. That's the only other money that we get besides donations or grants or anything else. Everything else is property tax. We have nothing to sell. Other special districts, cemetery districts, they can raise the cost of a plot. Irrigation districts, as much as they don't want to, they can raise the price of water. Um, uh, library districts, they can charge more for their library cards. There's all these different things that we have nothing to charge for. I right. can't charge for anything. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge that we face daily on here. And I'm going to just tell you, Mike and I agree on 95% of everything. This is the 5% that kills me because we're trying to make a city survive and work, right? That's the challenge that we face with that. Yeah, none of us want to raise anybody's property taxes. We don't want to pay any more than we have to either. But we want to be able to provide the service. The service that, that we provide today, we want to continue to be able to provide it. And if we can't hire people to open up new stations as our districts grow, then that level of service drops a little tiny bit every time the community grows. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, yes, sir. Let's bring in someone from the other side. Your neighbor just went across the street from Idaho. Can you clarify for me what the law is about uh, ATVs and side by sides and golf carts and you driving them and things like that? I so, that's so the qu so the question, real quick, is on ATVs, UTVs, and youth driving them in the city of Star. You want some clarification? You're going to stand on the sidewalk. Spot, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Just go. Uh, just drive and go as fast as you can. Kid. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, I'm kidding. There is, there's a lot of misinformation about that. So as far as any type of UTV, well, first off, let's start with youth. Youth can't drive. You have to have a valid driver's license. So period. Yes. So if you're driving either a UTV, uh, they call it an NEV neighborhood electric vehicle or a golf car, anything like that on a public street, uh, you have to have a valid driver's license and the vehicle also has to be licensed and registered and and insured and it has to be road legal you know your blinkers brake lights side mirrors all of that passengers same thing it, it's all rules apply yeah across the board but they can put passenger so if there's an adult driving it with kids in it they can do that yes 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 that's completely fine just no kids you know a, a 12 year old can't be driving right you know uh well if you're on the road, I'm going to say yes on that one. There's there's a small few caveats that I think you may be able to get by on, uh, but for the majority, yes, you have to be seat belted. Now there is uh, so there's the there's a state code. Uh, see if I can remember. I think it's forty nine six six three, which is the NEV vehicle one that states that any neighborhood electric vehicle, golf cart, anything along those lines, um, it has a bunch of stipulations on what the golf cart has to have has to be road legal, um, you know, which includes everything that we went over, brake lights, side mirrors, all of that. You have to be a valid driver's license, has to be insured. It cannot go on a road anything over roughly 25 miles an hour. So it says you cannot drive on a road that is over 25 miles an hour. So a lot of people get upset about this because Pollard, where the golf course is, is 35. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to drive their, you know, golf carts up there, but it's 35 miles an hour. It's posted, so you can't drive your golf cart up to the golf course to go play. So it, it creates a little bit of a, a pain there, but that's an arterial road, so we don't want golf carts on arterial roads where we're trying to push traffic to, and, you know, they're slowing it down, impeding this, that, everything else. Um, so the golf carts, the neighborhood electric vehicles, even though the salesperson there may say, yeah, you're, you're good to go, drive them. Make sure you read, uh, I believe it's, 49-663, um, that'll state all the rules and, and laws on when you can and cannot drive those. Now, there is a caveat to that, and don't get mistaken, your golf cart, your UTV, your this and that, that you're just driving around town, that's totally separate than a farmer on a quad or a UTV or anything like that with a placard in the back that's doing agriculture. 
So that is 100% legal. So any, any farmer that's zipping up and down Star, you see it all the time across the bridge, zipping up and down Star Road because they're doing any agriculture or you know, uh, cleaning out irrigation or anything along those lines, they have to have a placard on the back and they have to be doing agricultural uh, you know, duties and that is 100% legal. So if I put a shovel with my golf clubs, we're good? I refuse to answer that. <laughs> uh, who? The farmer. Uh, so the farmer, they there is, uh, there is no there is no speed limit regulations on them or anything. So, uh, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, they could almost take it up Highway 16 on the side of the road as long as they're doing agriculture work. So, uh, you know, obviously we love it. Idaho, very ag heavy. We want you know keep them and all the laws that we can to protect them. So, so I just I want to I want to add to that just so everybody's aware, Idaho has a right to farm state. Mm -hmm. So any development that happens next to farming ground, tough on you, man. Right? They can create dust, they can put pigs over there, they can do whatever they want on their land, and you can't do a thing about it, which is true because it's their property and they were farmers there before the housing. Right? So that's on every single plat, right? That's got the right to farm on that plat. So, hey, go ahead, sorry. Is it legal to um, operate golf carts on sidewalks, city sidewalks? It is not. Yeah, so you cannot take a golf cart or anything along those along the sidewalk. Sidewalks are meant for pedestrian traffic. So even bicycles, technically, per se, are not supposed to be on sidewalks. So this is where the challenge arises, because ACHD, if you look at Floating Feather, what they've done there, uh, going from Pollard to Highway 16, they've created these 10-foot paths. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where it might change eventually. They've created these 10-foot paths so the bicyclists and stuff get off of the main road, right, with a separated... Um, Oh, what do you call it? Detached side, no. right? Yeah. With the landscape strip between it. And this is where we're going to run into conflict with that, I think, in the future. And this is where they have discretion. That's why I don't really want to take this discretionary thing. I know. Um, there is a lot of, um, with, with these widenings that, worked, that we were talking about earlier, there's like bike lanes and stuff that are built into these widenings outside of the sidewalks. However, that 10 foot segment, you see that they put it up there on Chinden. That whole 10-foot sidewalk all the way to Highway 16 on our side. That's what they're going to on these state highways is putting those 10-foot pathways to get the bicycles and stuff like that onto the sides. So that, that might change the dynamics here in the future. Yeah, I mean, we, I, we love the fact that, you know, people can jump in their golf carts and go to a restaurant or something like that. We think that's awesome. And, and I think that's something that for the five years that I've been in Star and the 10 years that I've been in Idaho, it's, it's one of the cool things that I always loved about this town was people could – you know, throw their kids in the UTV, go to the park, you know, enjoy the park and, you know, drive back. Um, however, with the growth that we're seeing and the more irresponsible drivers that we're seeing, I hate to say a couple are going to ruin it for everybody, yeah. but um, we've had some serious collisions that have occurred where people have, you know, been paralyzed, you know, brain dead. I, I mean, there's some really bad things that have happened because of these UTVs and on the roadways. And not being responsible. And not being responsible. So with that, you know, I, I hate to say that a couple of bad people have maybe ruined it for everybody else, but at the same time, we need to look out for everybody as a whole. So uh, officers have discretion, obviously, if they come and talk to you and this, that, everything else. Just make sure you read that code and that you know, you know, what you can and can't do in those and kind of go that route with them. The reason for my question is because I'm the president of our HOA and I get texts and messages about so-and-so's driving on the sidewalk. What is the recommendation? Because I'm like, that's not within my purview. Yeah, so you're 100% right. Um, and with that, if if they have any concerns on those ends, have them reach out to us. We have a non-emergency dispatch line, or they can come down to the Star Police Station and talk to Jada or myself or anybody down there. Um, anything along those, we would much rather go to the neighbor and educate them on hey, you can't do this. And they're like, well, I thought I couldn't be on the roadway. You're, you're right, you can't. You can also not be on the sidewalk, <laughs> you know. Um, so we would much rather go educate hey, them. drive in the grass area? Yeah, you know, okay. just get permission from all your neighbors and go across the grass. Mm -hmm. No, I think we're getting to the point now where it's probably something that we're going to have to start pushing out a lot more, especially with the, the huge growth. Um, I thought he... Yeah. Zach might have something put together. We'll check with him because I know he was working on something. Yeah. Yeah. There he wrote was a letter on it. Yeah. He wrote a chat with the chief on that. So okay. you could, you could, he could pull that up, get that. And maybe we can send, have you guys send it out again. 
Yeah, since we're getting to the warmer weather. That'd be a great idea, especially. Can you yes. put it, can Do you, you have one? Police page? Can you yeah. put it on the police page of the website? David doesn't David? want any more work back here. Can they put it on the police page on the website? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Just if you could remind, remember, dig that out. Yeah. yeah Just no, I'll, I'll talk to Hassing yeah. and make sure that we get that all squared away. And you can remember I, that just I'm going to bring this up. Um, you can shoot and hunt uh, in the city limits of star um, as long as you're safe. Right. Um, people hunt along the Boise River all the time, you know, things like that. So that's not going away <laughs> anytime soon, as far as I'm concerned. And with that being said, you know, discharging a firearm and say in the city of Star is legal, right? As long as it's in a safe manner. If you are concerned that somebody may or may not be hunting illegally or anything along those lines, please call us because a lot of people don't know in the state of Idaho, it's a misdemeanor to harass or annoy a hunter. So we've had a couple instances, not here in Star, we've had a couple close ones here in Star, but uh, our neighboring town over where people believe they have the right to go scare off the ducks and the geese yeah. and anything else. And that's actually a misdemeanor that they're committing. And a lot of them don't know that. So please call us. We'll go out, we'll check hunting license. We'll check fishing license. We'll make sure that their firearms are the correct ones and they're doing everything legally. And then we'll notify you of that. So yeah. please just reach out to us. Yeah. Don't be that person. Yeah. It's you generally have somebody good. with a firearm. Don't be that person that goes and confronts them. That's bad news. I teach hunters that too, and that's not a good thing, right? When you do that. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just a reminder, you know, for the police department, when it comes to, um, you know, kids on, <laughs> um, sorry, kids on uh, golf carts, because we do have one, um, you know, it's a no no. And then also about hunting, because my household were avid hunters and we have been harassed down there in the river. So it's just, hey, you know, this is legal. So that way you don't have that, you know, yeah. those issues. So, yeah, we just did it as, hey, just, just to let you know. Hey, just invite them to come hunt with you. Show them how it's done. Well, there's no secret spot around here. It's all open around here. All right. We, it's 440-ish. Was it an hour? What are we doing? Whatever. Do you guys have any other questions or anything before we cut out? Okay. Yeah. And then, and then uh, if you're coming out here on the State Street, take a right. It's a lot easier than going left. <laughs> yep. All right. Dana's got us out. Oh. Yeah. We have someone online that just is saying less fast food. Well, that's less fast food. That's, so again, I'm going to just say this. It's not the government's job to decide winners and losers in business. It's the people's job to decide if they're going to go to those businesses. We only provide the opportunity in our comprehensive plan for people to be successful with their property. It's just the reality of the situation. We do have one coming. Yes, beautiful. So um, I do want to say, guys, there is, um, if you know any seniors or whatnot, we have what's the Golden uh, uh, Expo thing that's happening over at Greylock this Saturday, uh, sponsored by the Star Chamber and the Star, or in the, um, um, oh my goodness, Southwest Idaho Business Alliance. I was like, I was calling them, couldn't figure that out for whatever reason. Um, so if you have any seniors and stuff, it looks like they have a lot of cool programming going on over there uh, at that location on Saturday. So I would encourage people to go attend. Can, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid to ask because I'm getting close, I think. So what rodeo? Oh, oh fishing rodeo. Fishing rodeos on, I, well, I was, if you're going to talk about the Eagle Rodeo, I'm not even going to talk about that one. But our fishing rodeo is on May 18th. Um, over here at the ponds by the river house there at Freedom Park. And that's the police fishing rodeo. And that's a really good time and interaction with the kids and our police officers. And cause we get officers from all over the county that come and help out with that, which is really cool uh, to see. So cool. Mayor, if I may, before, sure. before you take off real quick, I do want to say anybody, obviously everybody in here and anybody watching online, uh, there is, and Dana posted it, there is a spoof going out right now where people are using star police's phone number to call you and say that you've missed jury trial or that you're, uh, you know, 
and now you owe us five hundred dollars because there's a warrant coming out. So they did take over Star Police's phone number. I think a couple of days ago, Dana. Yeah. So that is going around. The only thing that I I really hope, and I think we're going to try and get better uh, with some changes with our our social media accounts. So if you do have a social media account, please follow the City of Star and please follow Star Police because we posted that almost immediately. And that way, if there is any spoofs like that, anything going on, um, please, you know, uh, always come to us. If, especially if anybody ever is asking for money on the phone, even if it's legitimate, please walk in and come talk to us and, and we'll vet the process or figure it out or help you guys through it. Um, nobody ever asks for gift cards. <laughs> uh, so please do not give any gift cards or wire transfers or cryptocurrency or anything like that. And but, apparently my name has gotten picked up with a fake email address going out there asking for this stuff too. So I'm not asking you for it. I'll just come and see you in person. Yeah. So donations, it, please follow the city of star Facebook page and, and the yeah. star police page for these exact instances. And if you know anybody, especially that are older, please tell them if anybody ever calls and asks for money, go directly down to the star police station and we'll help you vet the whole process and make sure that you're safe because I cannot tell you how much money the citizens of star lose yearly to scammers. And it's money that we cannot get back because nine times out of 10, it, well, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it's overseas or somewhere else and it's gone as soon as you send it. Um, so it is, it's extremely hard and it's a, it's a crime that really impacts people. Yep. So follow the Facebook accounts uh, or any social media or just come down to Star and talk to us and please try and spread that. But there is that phone number going around right now where it looks like us. It's not. <laughs> cool. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Be safe out there.